right, good morning. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Once again, let me give a, a warm welcome to all of those who are visiting today, especially the family members of, of the families that we dedicated. Thank you so much for coming and supporting them. And if you're new to Hollywood Community Church, I'd love to have the opportunity to meet you. Vicki and I will be down front at the conclusion of the service, and uh, we'd love to uh, meet with you and challenge you, or not challenge, get to know you. I don't know what I was saying there. Get to know you um, just a little bit. I don't want to scare you off. We don't want to challenge you to do anything. So, so today's message deals with a topic that is familiar to every single one of us. Because all of us, to one degree or another, struggle with anger. Do we not? Boy, nobody wants to admit that this morning, all right? All of us, to one degree or another, struggle with anger. And quite frankly, we all respond to it in different ways. Uh, you might be the person that gets mad and just explodes and, and, and lets loose. And I mean, in a matter of seconds, you say everything that's on your mind and, and you just let it go. That's the way you respond. Or maybe, maybe you're the opposite of that and you silently brood. All right? I, I mean, you're... Your spouse is yelling at you, and you don't say anything, but on the inside, you're steaming. And you just allow that anger to fester. Or maybe you're the type of person that at the moment doesn't do anything, but you look for an opportunity to get payback just as soon as possible. You, you look for an opportunity to get revenge just as soon as possible. I read this week about a, uh, a, a husband who frequently got mad at his wife. And in the course of their discussions, he would, he would get mad and he would blow up and he would yell at his wife. And, and yet she would quietly respond and, and not yell back. And so one day he asked her, he said, how come is it that whenever I get mad at you and, and we're fighting, you don't fight back with me? How do you control your anger? What do you do to control your anger? And she looks at him and said, I clean the toilet. And, and, and he, he says, uh, I don't get it. How does cleaning the toilet help you respond correctly? How does it help you to get back at me? And she simply said, I use your toothbrush when I clean the toilet. <laughs> so, <laughs> So husbands, if your wife responds quietly, I would check that toothbrush on a regular basis, all right? In the passage that we're studying this morning, Jesus talks about the seriousness of anger. And Jesus shares with us that anger is not just a simple lack of control. As a matter of fact, Jesus says that anger is not an acceptable form of expression. Because you might hear sociologists and, uh, and family leaders who would say, no, 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 it's okay. Just get mad, blow off. That's a great way to blow off steam. Just get angry and demonstrate it. Jesus says very clearly in today's passage that anger is sin. And as a result... Anger is worthy of judgment. And you'll be surprised, maybe, at the directness with which Jesus speaks in the passage that we're looking at today. I want to begin just by reading the first two verses in the passage. We're in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verses 21 and 22. Notice what Jesus says. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Pretty strong words. Would you pray with me today? Holy Spirit of God, we're asking you today to help us 
to understand this passage. But even more importantly, not just to understand it, but to apply it to our lives. Lord, Lord, help us to realize that, that anger destroys relationships. It not only destroys our relationships with our fellow man, but it impedes our relationship with you. Help us to understand today the seriousness of that and help us to understand even more importantly how desperately we need your help. And so, Lord, today, Lord, I pray that you'd work in our hearts. God, if there's any broken relationships, Lord, I pray that by your power, you would enable us, you would help us to be able to fix them. And I pray that we would allow the power and the righteousness of Jesus Christ to help us to control our anger. And we thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So since the beginning of the year, we've been studying the Sermon on the Mount. You saw our praise team today. Our our sermon series very simply is called Flipped. And the idea being that that, um, this passage of Scripture, Jesus' teaching kind of turns upside down the way that we look at things. We tend to look at things in one way, and yet Jesus comes in with this sermon that we're studying and kind of turns the way we've thought, the way we've believed, upside down, kind of flips it over. We began studying the Beatitudes in the beginning of Matthew chapter 5. And just to remind you, the Beatitudes are godly characteristics, characteristics that give us joy regardless of life's circumstances. You'll see that each of those verses begins with blessed or blessed are the poor in spirit. And that word blessed means happy. And it's not just an external uh, uh, superficial happiness, but it's an internal joy that you and I can demonstrate regardless of what is taking place in our lives. We then saw that we are the light of the world. And as the light of the world, we have the responsibility to influence the world. And you and I have a a world of our own, and your responsibility and my responsibility is to influence our world where God has placed us with our testimony. So I would ask you this morning, are you making an impact on your world? Uh, Are you making an impact with the people with whom you come in contact Are you light and are you salt? If you're not, you're not fulfilling your responsibility. Last week we saw that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and we also saw that in addition to that, grace does not lower God's expectations. To the contrary, grace raises God's expectations. Um, in this day and age, there's this, there, there's this great divide between what we'd call legalism and antinomianism. Legalism would be this list of rigid rules that you have to follow. And if you don't follow them, man, you're in danger of judgment. But the pendulum effect is what is taking place in evangelicalism today. Because we sit back and say, I'm no longer under the law, I'm under grace. So that means I'm allowed to do whatever I want. God has lowered the standards. And yet we'll see in the coming weeks that Jesus has not lowered the standards. To the contrary, I believe that Jesus has raised the bar. And so beginning with the passage of scripture that we're looking at today, Jesus gives us six illustrations of rabbinical expectations. That's simply teachings of the rabbis that were, that were teaching the religious leaders in Jesus' day what they taught to the people of Israel. And he begins each illustration with this phrase, you have heard that it was said. As a matter of fact, you saw that in verse 21. You have heard that it was said. If you have your Bibles in front of you, jump to verse 27 because that's the next illustration. He says, you have heard that it was said. In verse 31 is the next one. It also was said. And so he said, you've heard that it was said. You see, we have it right up here on our wall. You have heard that it was said. But then Jesus says, but I say to you. So Jesus takes this this rabbinical teaching, and instead of lowering the bar, he raises the bar. 
In, in those illustrations, Jesus does the opposite of what we would expect. He doesn't relax the requirements, he tightens them. As a matter of fact, as I mentioned, he doesn't lower the bar, he raises it. And that's exactly what Jesus does with the subject that we're addressing today, the subject of anger. And once again, this is so prevalent because all of us at one time or another get angry. Do we not? Does anybody want to admit that? All right. All of us at one time or another. Listen, if your spouse did not shake his or her head, yes or no, give them a great big elbow. All right. Because, because you know they do. Or a kiss on the cheek as somebody's doing right now. One of the two. All right. All of us deal with. With anger. So if you have your outlines in front of you, just a couple of things that I want us to see. The first is this. Anger affects the way that you view yourself. A anger affects the way that I view myself. Here's what I mean by making that statement. Um, I would remind you that Jesus is addressing his comments to the religious elite. Jesus is addressing many of his comments to the spiritual leaders in the nation of Israel. Individuals who felt as if they had arrived spiritually. Many of them felt as if they weren't in need of Jesus' teaching because they were already spiritual. They already knew the law. They already memorized the law. And so they were hesitant to accept Jesus' teaching. After all, they'd never committed murder. After all, they had never committed adultery. And so the things that Jesus was saying probably did not apply to them. In their mind, let Jesus speak to the real sinners. Let Jesus speak to the real publicans. And in this passage, Jesus strips away every vestige, every trace of self-righteousness. And Jesus lets them and he lets us know that our anger demonstrates that we are real sinners. Every time we demonstrate anger, whether it's vocal and loud or whether it's quiet and internal, by holding on to that anger, we demonstrate our sinful nature and we demonstrate our need of Jesus Christ. Now, let me say from Scripture we know that Jesus does not prohibit every form of anger. Because you might sit back today and say, hold on, Brian, Jesus himself got angry. Jesus walked into the temple, and you, you know the story, the money changers were in the temple, and they were selling things, and Jesus himself got angry. So when Jesus got angry, did he sin? Obviously, the answer to that is no. Jesus demonstrated righteous anger when he cleansed the temple. Even in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26, the apostle Paul says this. He says, be angry and do not sin. So in other words, there are times that you and I can demonstrate anger and that anger not be sinful. You say, okay, Brian, when is that then? Well, here's what I wrote in my outline. It's in your notes. There is a difference between righteous anger and selfish anger. Let me say it again. There is a difference between righteous anger and selfish anger. Righteous anger deals with God's holiness. Righteous anger deals with God's character. Righteous anger is demonstrated when God is dishonored, when God's word is rejected, and when God's name is blasphemed. Here, Jesus is not talking about that type of, of anger, the type of anger that he demonstrated in the temple. Here, Jesus is speaking of selfish anger. Anger that you and I feel whenever someone uh, says something to us that we don't like. Or anger that is demonstrated whenever someone treats us in a way that we do not feel like we should be treated. You see, righteous anger is about God. Selfish anger is about me. Selfish anger is about you. It's about us. And in verse 22, Jesus gives three illustrations of this type 
of anger. And so notice verse 22 once again, because the first thing he says is this, selfish anger involves bitterness. Verse 22, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable of judgment. The word that Jesus uses for anger has the idea of brooding. Does anybody understand that word brooding? I mean, brooding is the idea of, you know, just kind of sitting there and, and being upset and steaming about it and, and, and letting that anger to simmer and fester in your mind and in your heart. It's, it's an anger that is nurtured, an anger that you will not allow to die. It's an anger that cherishes resentment and does not want reconciliation. Here's a couple of phrases that this type of anger would say, I'll never forgive that person for what he or she did to me. I'm sorry, I will never forgive them. I'll never be friends with that person again. That, that's the type of anger that Jesus is describing. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15, the writer of Hebrews uh, uses this phrase for that same type of anger. He calls it the root of bitterness. And here's what he says. Don't allow that root of bitterness to take root in your life. You know, bitterness doesn't affect the person to whom we're bitter. Bitterness affects us. And bitterness eats at us. And it, it actually changes us. So Jesus says, selfish anger involves bitterness. Now, let me ask you as we go through this, would you be honest with yourself today? And, and as, we li as we talk about this, think in your mind and ask the Holy Spirit of God, is there anybody to whom or with whom I feel that type of anger? He says the second thing, selfish anger involves insults. In the passage, and I'm reading out of the ESV, he says, whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. All right, you might have an older translation. Your older translation would say this, whoever says raka to his brother is liable to the council. You might sit back and say, what in the world does raka mean? Well, raka is a word that basically... Um, cannot and has not been translated, it has no modern day equivalent. Um, in some really modern translations, it's been translated empty head, <laughs> it's been translated blockhead, it's been translated worthless idiot. Um, the, 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 they're not exact translations, but as they try to translate that word, uh, that is what it means, brainless idiot. Here's what it refers to. It, it refers to you and me being mad at a person and intentionally insulting that person. Do we ever do that? We get so mad that, that our anger turns into what? It turns into name calling. And all of a sudden we begin to look for an opportunity to hurt that person, to damage that person. And so we do what? We throw insults at them. Jesus says that is selfish anger. Now, we tend to excuse that type of anger. Well, Brian, in the heat of the moment, I know I say things that I shouldn't say. It's no big deal. And God says, no, no, no. It is a big deal. It, it's not just blowing off steam. It's not just saying something that you really didn't mean. I didn't mean it. I mean, we meet with couples all the time, and, and uh, you know, I mean, they... You know, they say, Pastor Brian, you wouldn't believe what my husband says to me or you wouldn't believe what my wife says to me. And the response is, yeah, but you know I didn't mean that. We say stuff like that all the time. Jesus said, that, that is a serious offense. Jesus says, you're guilty and you are worthy of judgment when you respond that way. He, he says a third thing. He says, selfish anger involves character assassination. In verse 22, he says, whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hell 
fire. The word fool there is a really interesting word. It's the word from which we get our word moron. <laughs> so basically look at a person and say, man, you are a moron. You are moronic. But I believe Jesus was even going deeper than that because the term that Jesus uses here not only means stupid or dull, but it was often used to describe a godless person. And so basically I I think what Jesus is saying here, it's whenever we get mad and we begin to intentionally assassinate or attack the character of a person and, and publicly we begin to question their godliness. We begin to question their integrity. And we have the intention of making them look bad in front of others. I mean, our goal is to make them look bad. And we do that in any way we possibly can. Jesus is talking about the attempt to destroy the reputation of another. We assassinate their character. Notice what Jesus said. It's really interesting, and we don't have time to really delve into it today, but, but in the first offense, he says, you're liable for judgment. In the second offense, he says, you are guilty before the council. The council was the Sanhedrin. It was like the, the supreme court of the nation of Israel. So here's what he says. You think these are light offenses, but I want you to know, man, just when you demonstrate bitterness, you are guilty before the council and you're liable for judgment. But man, when it, whenever you begin to hurl insults, you're not only guilty before the court, you are guilty before the supreme courts. And then he says, man, when you attack the character of someone, You are guilty of hell fire. Let me pause for a second and say this. I do not believe that Jesus is saying that if you call someone a fool or if you call someone a moron, that you are personally going to hell. I don't believe that's what Jesus is saying in the passage. I do believe this is what Jesus is saying. I believe that he is showing the seriousness of anger. All right? Anger is not just a mistake. Anger is not just a lack of self-control. Anger is a serious offense to God. As a matter of fact, if you're following along in your outlines, this is what I believe Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that anger is murder not yet committed. Anger is murder not yet committed. Notice what Jesus is saying. Verse 21, he said, you've heard that it was said, you shall not murder. That was the rabbinical requirement. But Jesus says, I'm going to raise the bar on that. Now, not only is murder worthy of judgment, but anger. Anger is incipient murder. Murder begins with what? Anger. As a matter of fact, sociologists often question how many people would be guilty of murder if the right circumstances presented themselves. Murder, most of the time, begins with anger. Here's what Jesus, or or, or what John says, obviously inspired by the Holy Spirit in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 15. John says this, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Well, those are strong words. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Jesus is saying that given the right situation, given the right circumstances, everyone could commit murder because everyone gets angry. Now, boy, that, can you imagine how that offended the righteousness of the Pharisees? What are you talking about? You're accusing us of murder. We are not murderers. And Jesus said, you know what? (laughs) The old standard was, you shall not commit murder. But Jesus said, I'm telling you now that everyone who gets angry is worthy of the exact same judgment. (laughs) Here's what I want to sink into our mind and our hearts today. Your anger comes from a sinful heart. 
my anger comes from a sinful heart and it demonstrates our desperate need for the righteousness of Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus is telling the scribes and the Pharisees, you're not near as spiritual as you think you are. And Jesus is telling us, you are not near as spiritual as you think you are. Why? Because in your heart is incipient murder. And when you get angry, and when you demonstrate that to someone else, you're demonstrating the sinful heart that you possess. You see, the simple truth is this. Our sinful hearts demonstrate our need of Jesus Christ. Notice what Jesus said in Matthew 15 and verse 19. He says, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. Jesus is saying just because you haven't outwardly committed murder doesn't mean that you haven't committed it in your heart already. Just because you haven't outwardly committed adultery, we're going to deal with that passage next week, doesn't mean that you haven't committed it in your heart already. Jesus is saying, examine your heart. Your anger demonstrates your need of Jesus. Let me show you a a second truth in the passage, and this is powerful. The second truth is this. Anger affects your worship. Anger affects your worship. Now, let me just, please do not raise your hands if this is describing you, all right? I'm asking a generic question. You ever got angry on the way to church? <laughs> I got to admit, I have. Come on, Vicki, we got to get going. Church starts in three hours. We got to get there early, you know? And so we run around and we're, and you're yelling and screaming at each other. Doesn't happen very often, does it, Vicki? Doesn't happen very often. Vicki, that's because you're the one that's getting mad at me, and I'm the one that's not getting mad at you. <laughs> at times, even coming to church, man, we're so rushed that, that what? Man, we come and we're, we're frustrated at each other. Man, I know it's happened to you. It happens to everybody. Even in the car on the way over, we're bickering and fighting, and we get out of the car, and all of a sudden, there's a smile on our face. <laughs> we put our, our arm around our spouse, We're in love with each other, even though we were bickering on the way to church, all right? And we're in love with each other, and all of a sudden, until we get back in the car on the way out, and then it starts up again right when we leave, all right? I'm sure that never happens to anybody here, right? Here's what Jesus is saying. Anger not only affects the way you view yourself, because you have a tendency to view yourself as more spiritual than you you really are, and I do too, but anger affects our worship. Notice, not my words, Jesus' words. Notice verse 23, he's continuing. So if you were offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Let me explain that in two ways. Let me explain that in an Old Testament context, and let me explain it in a New Testament context. So in the Old Testament, you're coming. It's the Day of Atonement. And on the Day of Atonement, once a year, you're to bring a lamb to the temple to sacrifice, to cover your sins. And so you as a family have sacrificed, and and you purchased this perfect lamb that you were bringing to the priest. And as you bring it to the priest, the priest has you place your hands on that perfect lamb. And shortly, that lamb will be sacrificed. And he says, "So, so you as a family have purchased this lamb. You are bringing it to the temple for sacrifice. And on the way to the temple... You remember, oh my word, I got this problem with Joe. Our man, Betty and I just aren't speaking to each other at all. Man, I I have a conflict with another person. Here's what Jesus says. Leave your sacrifice. Go and be reconciled to your brother. And then come back and offer your sacrifice. So we put that in a New Testament context because... Nobody brought a lamb this morning, right? I don't think nobody, I don't think anybody brought a lamb. So here's a New Testament context. You wake up on Sunday morning, 
and you're excited about coming to church. I hope you're excited about coming to church. You're excited about coming to church because we're going to worship and we're going to give to God a sacrifice of praise. And so Mark and the, and the praise team say, stand and, and let's worship God together. And you're about to open your mouth and give God a sacrifice of praise. And you look over and there's that person over there that just aggravates the living daylights out of you. All right, you know who, you talk, who I'm talking about. Yeah, and you look over and it's like, man, a lot of that person just makes me mad, you know. Maybe it's Brian. I have no idea who it is, you know. And, and so you have a problem with that person. And actually notice the text even says, it doesn't even say if you have a problem with that person. It says you see a brother who what? Has a problem with you. And so there's another person who has a grudge or a problem with you. Here's what Jesus says. Before you offer that sacrifice of praise, what are you to do? Go to that brother or sister. Be reconciled to that brother or sister. And then come back and offer your sacrifice of praise. You see, here's what I believe Jesus is saying in the passage. Two ways I summarize this. Your relationships with others affect your relationship with God. Catch that. Your relationships with others affect your relationship with God. We have an ability, and we tend to, to separate certain areas of our life. All right, I can be at odds with all of these people. But when I come to church, I can kind of put that in my back pocket. I can forget about it. And me and God, we're cool, man. All right, I, I might not be good with these people over here, but God and I, man, we're on good terms. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. If you're not on good terms with your brother and sister, you are not on good terms with me. In other words, Here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, you must be right horizontally before you can be right vertically. Do you get that? You must be right horizontally before you can be right vertically. Verse 23, Jesus says, you come, you're ready to offer your sacrifice, and you remember that your brother has something against you. You might not be the one who is upset, but you know that another brother, another sister, another person is upset with you. Here's what Jesus is saying. Then you must do everything in your power to make that relationship right before you worship. Now, I realize you can't always do that. Paul says in Romans, as much as lies within you, be at peace with all men. And so sometimes you can attempt, but you just can't do it. But here's what Jesus is saying. Don't divide your worship, your relationship with me, away from your relationship with everyone else. They affect one another. I, say, I think it's seen very clearly in Ephesians chapter 5, and I didn't put it in your notes, but in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, the Apostle Paul says this, don't be drunk with wine, don't be controlled by any other substance, but be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. And then he lists three ways that demonstrate what a Holy Spirit-filled person looks like. A Holy Spirit-filled person is joyful, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. A uh, Holy Spirit-filled person is thankful in their hearts. And a Holy Spirit-filled person submits themselves to one another in the fear of God. And right after that, the Apostle Paul gives the longest explanation of relationships in the entire New Testament. What is Paul talking about? My relationships with others affect my relationship with God. I cannot worship correctly until I do everything possible to restore my relationships with others. That's what Jesus is saying. You say, Brian, that's tough. It is. Brian, that's difficult. It is. That means I have to humiliate myself and I'm not the one who was wrong. You're right. That's what you need to do. But Jesus is saying that's the requirement for worship. Let me show you a third thing. My time is almost done. The third thing is this. You must take the initiative in fixing broken relationships. 
Let me show you. Notice the last two verses. Jesus says in verse 25, come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Here's what I want you to catch. This might be the most important thing we say in the message. You say, Brian, what's the example? What's the motivation for this? The example in fixing broken relationships is none other than Jesus Christ. The example for fixing broken relationships is Jesus Christ. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? We're the ones that offended God. Is that not right? God, God, God created us. He gave us everything we need. And, and man, beginning with Adam and Eve and following through with us, we are the ones who offended God. So, so it would make sense for God to sit back and say, hey, you know what? I didn't offend you. You offended me. I'm here. Whenever you're ready, you take the first step. That's not the way God responds to us. God, God takes the first step. Even though he is the offendee and we are the offenders, God takes the first step in reaching out to us. Romans 5.8, but God demonstrated his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. In other words, we weren't even looking for him. We didn't even know we were sinners at that point. But God in his love does what? He takes the first step in restoring that relationship. What a great example for us. Although we offended him, he takes the first step in reaching out to us. Although we owed him, he fully paid our debt. What a great example. The second thing in my time is up, but the process for fixing broken relationships is clear. Let me give you a four steps because just maybe today you're here and there's a broken relationship in your life. It might be a broken relationship of somebody who attends here at Hollywood Community Church. It might be another family member. It might be somebody in your neighborhood. It might be someone in work. Brian, what, what are the steps towards fixing broken relationships? Well, Jesus says here in the passage that you must reach out to your accuser with urgency, and I would add with humility. Jesus says, come to terms with your accuser quickly. Now, why would we do that? Here it talks about judgment. I believe as believers we do that because I realize that a broken relationship affects my ability to worship God correctly. Man, even in the marriage, I've been reading through 1 Peter uh, this month. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, Paul talks about what the wives' responsibility is. And he comes to verse 7, and he says, Husbands, live with your wives according to knowledge, with understanding, treating them as a vessel of honor. And he makes this statement, that your prayers will not be hindered. In other words, he, he, he insinuates that if I'm not right with my wife, I'm not right with my spouse, it what? It affects my ability to communicate with God. My prayers are hindered. So Jesus says, come to terms with your accuser quickly. So I would recommend you, man, uh, reach out. Reach out to your accuser with urgency and with humility. The second thing that I would give is take responsibility for your mistakes. You might sit back and say, hey, Brian, it's not me. It's all that person. Well, yeah. Here's a Bible verse. It takes two to tango. I'm not sure exactly what the scripture or reference is there. All right? <laughs> in, order, in order to have a conflict, it what? It takes two people. And so th there is mistake on your part. There is incorrect response on your part. Own up to your mistakes. And with humility, reach out to that person and admit them. The third thing is you must love that person, even if they don't love you. 
Jesus says, we'll see it later on. Jesus says, man, what difference is it if you who call yourself my children only love those who love you? Why, even the heathens do that. Jesus says, no, you be different. You love your enemies. You love those who abuse you. You love those who despitefully use you. That's how they'll recognize that you're a son of mine. You love those who don't love you. And lastly, you forgive them as Christ has forgiven you. Such a powerful thought. Someone said that the Apostle Paul's game plan for relationship reconciliation is found in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32. Paul says this, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God, for the sake of Jesus Christ, has forgiven you. You say, Brian, I'm not going to forgive that person. They don't deserve my forgiveness. You might be right. But do you deserve God's forgiveness? Does God forgive you because you deserve it? God doesn't forgive Brian because of Brian. God forgives Brian because of Jesus. God doesn't forgive you because of you. God forgives you because of Jesus and what Jesus has done to you. So Paul says, we should forgive others just as God has forgiven us. So here's the application point today as we finish. The application point is this. You must allow Jesus to help you to control your anger. You can't do it on your own. It's not an innocent response. It's not just a lack of self-control. Jesus says it's sin, and it's worthy of judgment. Allow Jesus to control your anger and allow Jesus to fix your broken relationships. Jesus said, you've heard it said, you shall not commit murder. Whoever does is guilty. Jesus says, let me tell you, you're not only guilty if you commit murder, but if you get angry with someone else, you are guilty. Fix that relationship. I sit back and wonder, what would happen in the church if we took this command seriously? And ever we, whenever we knew that somebody was offended by our thoughts or actions, if we immediately reached out to that person and we would not allow disagreements or problems to fester. Sadly, churches are known for what? Churches are known at times for disagreements. Why is that? Because God's people don't respond with God's plan to fix their relationships. Don't allow anger to destroy your relationship. Allow God to work through you. Thank you.